The following program is being presented to you by a community producer. The statements, views, and opinions expressed are not necessarily those of ALC-TV or the City of Avon Lake. Welcome to Common Sense. Uh, the Common Sense program is a series of interviews with uh, interesting people so that we can learn uh, who they are, uh, what they do, and, and what makes sense to them and what doesn't in a clear, concise, and direct way. Uh, I'm Rudy Breglia, and today I'll be interviewing uh, Dr. David Baum, who's the uh, head of school of the new Northeast Ohio Classical Academy. Welcome, David. Thanks, Rudy. It's great to be here. Okay. Uh, why don't you start us off, David? Tell us, uh, give us some ba general background information, uh, uh, where you were born, where you've lived, that, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Sure. Uh, I was born uh, just next door in Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, outside of Wilkes-Barre, so on the eastern side of the state. We won't hold that against you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, did my undergraduate work at the University of Dallas. Okay. Uh, in history. And then I went on to graduate school at Yale, where I got my PhD okay. in European history. Uh, where I've lived, this is my 11th state. Okay. I've lived in 11 states and five countries. Okay. So right. I've been kind of moving around, and, and apparently that didn't do me a whole lot of good, that world traveler stuff, because I had a hard time finding you here today. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Avon, Avon Lake, you know, it's pretty close. I understand so. it's, it's, a, it's a fraught relationship, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, why did uh, uh, you uh, choose the uh, uh, educational field? Uh, did you have a role model? Uh, I did, a, and an experience, I think. Um, the University of Dallas has a really nice program. It's a term abroad program okay. in, in Rome. Uh, there are other terms abroad programs I guess you could do, but the school has one that funds and supports itself. And it was just such an amazing experience to be in Rome, to experience all that, being a kid mm. from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. It was overwhelming, right? And, uh, and there was a professor there, Jane Brown, Dr. Brown, and uh, she was flamboyant and brilliant and charismatic and all wow. those things. So uh, I remember distinctly asking her a question, uh, which was, how do I do this? And she said, what's the this? And I said, well, I would like a life like yours, and I would like it somehow to be connected to Italy and all the stuff that we're learning here. And so she's the one who walked me through what my career uh, should look like if I wanted it to land right. And so my PhD is in Renaissance Italian history. It's what I've written on. And I've stayed close to that sort of Western tradition uh, focus that we had there, learning about ancient Rome, we went to Greece, we read about the Renaissance, all those things, which are in fact the foundation of much of what we're going to do um, at this new school, at the Classical Academy. It's all right there as a, as a base. Okay. Well, uh, having an Italian-American background, uh, I uh, uh, compliment you All on right. your choice. Uh, Thanks. But uh, uh, for the f uh, s sake of this interview, uh, why did you pick the Academy specifically? Well, um, so this is my second time being a head of school of a, of a, of a school that's based on the Western tradition, sort of great books, that's kind of thing. I uh -huh. was head of school uh, um, in Tempe, Arizona at, at Tempe Preparatory Academy. And uh, so that's been kind of in my blood since I moved out of college teaching into secondary administration. And when I saw this opportunity, um, I was actually at a school out in uh, Lake Tahoe at a, at a prep school there. And uh, I looked at this and I thought, this is, th this is what I do. Okay. So I, I reached out, and the conversations went well, and so here I am. There you go. Yeah. Uh, pardon my ignorance, but what is a public a charter school? So a public charter school, really, if you break it down, is exactly that. The, st uh, the state of Ohio, like many states, provides a publicly funded option for, uh, for families, for parents and students. Uh, and in Ohio, it's called a community school. Uh, but other states charter school, so I, I prefer to use charter. It's a sort of more 
universally recognized term. But basically what that is, is um, a school makes an application to the state and says we would like public funding for a school that will meet all the state standards and expectations, uh -huh. but in a very particular way. Like this is what our school is going to do that's different from a traditional public school to uh, meet or achieve those public expectations. So for us, what we did was we put together an application that said we would like to use a classical education model that's been uh, put together, detailed by Hillsdale College, and we would like to use their curriculum to, uh, to have a public school. It's open to anybody, it's tuition free. Uh, if you're within what I call our blast zone, if you're close enough to get to our school, then uh, it's, it's free with the exception of uh, the stuff that public school parents have to pay generally, you know, co-curriculars, extracurriculars, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's what charter schools are, are specifically uh, tailored educations that still serve the public interest. And so it's like a contract. That charter, if you think Magna Carta, okay. right, the great charter, right. it's a contract. We contract with the state. We say, this is exactly how we're going to educate these kids. And when parents bring their kids to us, um, they're also accepting that charter, that agreement, to, be, to have their kids educated the way we've proposed, not some traditional public uh, approach, but in this very particular way. Our charter agreement is over 400 pages with the state. So when you go through all of that, you will see exactly what it is we intend to do to people's kids. Okay. Uh, uh, what is the uh, Barney Charter School Initiative? So that's, that's Hillsdale's initiative to take some of the values and approaches in education that Hillsdale College itself employs and to extend that out into K through 12 education. It's about 12 years old, maybe a little older. Um, probably in conception it's older than that obviously in terms of introduction. It's about a dozen years old and right now um, that's, that provides the guidance and the, the support for dozens of schools across the country, and just in the state of Ohio, probably a, about a dozen. Okay. Uh, uh, describe the process for becoming a Hillsdale College member school. So, first of all, there's a couple of different levels of affiliation with a Hillsdale College. So there's a, a, a member school where you are, you get full support from Hillsdale, uh, they help you with your staff development and your professional development and in the selection of your head of school as well as providing your curriculum. We are a school that chose just to go in the direction of uh, taking Hillsdale's curriculum. So what you do is there's an application process to Hillsdale. You show them what it is that y you, know, you have going. Do you have all the requisite uh, sort of touchstones accomplished? Do you have a building site? Do you have a functioning board? Okay. Do you have a head of school if you're not going to go through their head of school uh, recruitment process? So there's a checklist that you go through and it takes from first conception to the point where you're actually hiring your head of school and envisioning opening. It's about two and a half years. Okay. It's a pretty serious process. And, and what's the ongoing relationship like? So the ongoing relationship, again, can vary. If you're a, Hillsdale, a, a full Hillsdale member school, it's sort of an, it, it, I, I think that's a pretty intimate and ongoing relationship where they provide leadership training, uh, as I said, staff and faculty development, summer workshops, uh, all of that kind of stuff. If you're a curriculum-only school, as we are, there's still support for you in terms of uh, ensuring a curriculum alignment, keeping you up to date on changes that they may themselves wish to make in readings or approaches, updating pedagogy and so on. And you always have access to the people that they use for their member schools to provide professional and staff development. Mm -hmm. So we could contract with them ourselves rather than going through Hillsdale. I uh, understand. Uh, uh, why use the uh uh, Hillsdale uh, College classical curriculum. Uh, that's bigger. It's a, it's a it's a book that's bigger than our charter. It's 650 pages of well-researched curriculum. I see. So it means we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. And it's very very detailed um, as to texts that get used at every grade level, um, when to use them, how to integrate them with one another. 
Um, it provides pedagogical uh, support. Um, so for example, uh, uh, we use the Singapore Math, um, which is widely used internationally, very, very successful, at Hillsdale's uh, recommendation, and we understand where and how to integrate that into the curriculum. Um, it's, uh, it, it just, it's a full package. It's a kind of like click and buy. If mm -hmm. you absorb it, if you study it, if you're me, and then you have to train faculty to be able to use it, it's so much easier than having to invent that entire curriculum for yourself. And, and were I to invent a curriculum myself, it would probably look, if I had the time and the patience, it would look a whole lot like what Hillsdale put together. I think. So. But they've done it already. Now, you mentioned Singapore math. Mm -hmm. uh, I might, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. So it's a, it's a mathematics that was developed, as the name implies, for the Singapore education system. And um, Singapore is one of those uh, you know, sort of small nations that always ends up at the top of international yeah. education, you know, uh, you know, the yearly rankings and so forth. And so it's, um, it's an approach to mathematics that's more like probably what you and I experienced when we were uh, in, say, elementary school ourselves, uh, much more focused on um, sort of the memorization of things like multiplication tables and so forth. Remember those. To, to, yeah, and, 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 and to kind of follow, if I can get kind of classical about it, you know, Plato said that we only know what we remember. And somewhere along the line, we got this idea in education that um, memorizing things somehow or another crimp the style yeah, of, of kids, that that's a bad thing. What we want is kids to have a much more sort of free-flowing engagement with the world of ideas. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about that. I mean, I've read Rousseau, and I understand that sort of, you know, 18th century, uh, uh, you know, alternative educational approach. But memorizing the, you know, the multiplication tables kind of makes it a whole lot easier than to just go ahead and do that more freeform stuff. You know, when more you're, efficient. Yeah, when you're trying to figure out, you know, when that train that left Pittsburgh is going to arrive in Chicago if something else happens in St. Louis, you know, it's kind of nice to have that stuff at your disposal. Fingertips, yeah. You know. Right. So the think work follows that sort of a hard work of memorization and so forth. And Singapore math has that built into the structure. Understand. Uh, what are trivium and quadrivium educational approaches under the Hillsdale College so those curriculum? Are, yeah, those are oldie timey terms that go back to the Middle Ages. Uh, and, and literally, uh, trivium means the three ways and quadrivium means the four ways. Right? And so if you, if you studied any Latin when you were a kid, you recognize that. Uh, this was the name given to the medieval uh, curriculum based on classical models. When the Middle Ages looked back to antiquity, tried to absorb and utilize the, the pedagogy and the learning of antiquity, which was revered, uh, this was what they came up with, the seven liberal arts. And they're divided into three and to four. Three linguistic arts, the trivium, and four mathematical uh, and scientific arts, that's the quadrivium. So for the Middle Ages, the trivium was the more important of them, but the quadrivium, which included you know, geometry and, and music, astronomy, um, mathematics, uh, what we would maybe call arithmetic, uh, were important enough, but it was really logic, grammar, rhetoric. That's what the Middle Ages built its curriculum on. And in some ways, that, that follows in the model that we have for the classical academy. What we want to really emphasize uh, uh, out of that curriculum are the, are the language skills that the Middle Ages um, really highly developed. Start kids off with the structures of language, including an awareness of good things that had been written. Study language through good and great texts. And then after that grammar, which that's why we have the name grammar school, after you've done all that, then you're ready to learn how to think critically, which the Middle Ages called logic, so that you could um, manipulate, as it were, the terms in front of you in ways that um, made sense, that were rational, all to the goal of rhetoric, of, of creating persuasive speech. Uh, I keep thinking of the phrase tried and true. It, 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 it is a tried and true approach, and you can call it what you want, by the way, but 
language education in the West has some, somehow or another kind of banked off of this idea of the trivium since the Middle Ages. And I know we, you know, we had the linguistic turn and the and language education revolution that happened in the last century early on and has been very important. But you can, you can read all those guys, Wittgenstein and Saucer and all those like fancy guys you meet in graduate school. At the end of the day, the education they have to come back to and address in language is the trivium. I understand. Uh, is the uh, uh, academy uh, tuition free? It, it is because it's supported by the state of Ohio. So we are, we are reimbursed per student from the state, so there's no cost to families, as I said, except for those things that are extra, um, like extracurriculars, co-curriculars. And our school will be a uniform-wearing school. So uh, parents will uh, want to put that in their budgets. Uh, and uh, we think that it's a great idea to have uniforms, uh, and we hope parents and students embrace that. Uh, it just cuts down on so much other stuff that's a distraction. Uh, and, uh, you know, our colors are good colors. And, uh, you know, the uniforms are traditional, classic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm well, excited I, about that. I think it solves some problems for parents. It does. You know, they don't have to worry about uh, what their children are wearing. Yeah, you've got a closet full of school uniforms. Kids can pick combinations as they wish, or they're grade appropriate and gender appropriate and so forth, and do that, and, uh, and you're good. And, uh, and you know what your uh, school clothing costs are going to be kind of right up front when you buy s stuff for the, for the year. And once we're around for a while, I'm sure there'll be a, a, a vibrant used uniform market. True. They grow like weeds. That's, they they do, a, and so we're, we're expecting there'll be some transfer of wardrobe uh, between families. Understand, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, what grade levels will be offered in August of this year uh, when the academy opens for, so, for so real? We're starting with K through five to do that grammar school. Okay. And, and, that, and that makes a lot of sense for us because that's a kind of a contained unit. Uh, when you get to uh, middle school, there's other things that you need to do. So K through five for us uh, seemed optimal. Okay, uh, tell us some of the general details about the academy. Uh... General details. Okay, so I didn't know that details could be general, but I'm gonna go there. I thought maybe those were two different things. Uh, no, you're, the trivium you're thing. right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> so some of the details. Some, detail. some of, the, some of the, 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 the details of the school. Um, so in terms of curriculum, in terms of uh, what kids do on a daily basis. Uh, what, hi history, number of students. History, okay, uh, so those, so our class size. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, so the, uh, uh, it's K through five, but we will have different numbers in each of the grade levels. So what we're hoping to do is really stock K and one. So we'll have 75 in each of those, 25 to a class, three classes. Okay. And then second grade through fifth grade, we'll have 50 kids, two sections of 25. So we'll have a, a slightly broader base uh, at, at the lowest levels. Understand. And, and, and we, we, we think that makes sense because that's where parents are looking initially to place a kid, right? Second through fifth grade, people are already somewhere. Yeah, right, and, and they have to transfer. And they may want to stay, and, that, and we, rec you know, we respect that. But K through one, we want to be the choice for as many kids starting their education as possible. Um, so we've got in our class size, as I said, would be 25. That's that's a cap, um, and so I think that makes us. Uh, it gives us the ability to focus a little more closely on kids than say might be the case in public schools, where class sizes are can be significantly larger. Um, some of our classes may be smaller than that. Kindergarten, for example, we may go under 25 because those kids really need much more of that, you know, uh, close attention. Um, we have, so our school is set up right now to uh, enroll 350 kids. Uh, we have room to expand in the current facility out to K through eight. Uh, and we um, intend to uh, do an addition to the uh, building mm -hmm. to be able to accommodate that expansion so that as we expand the classrooms, we all also expand those things that say six through eight require that K through five don't. I will be adding a, a, a more elaborate um, gym facility and those kinds of things. Yeah, I think the viewers will be seeing a picture of your site, 
right now. Oh, good. So you can see that uh, we bought uh, an office building uh, that was transitioning, uh, and uh, we, we found a, it was a, a nice bargain, 38,000 square feet on nine acres. Wow. That, uh, in Copley, uh, right where 77 and 18 meet. And um, so it's real convenient. Uh, 38,000 square feet gives us uh, the ability to put all the office space we need, 19 classrooms plus specialty classrooms like art and music, um, and interior space for things like assembly and um, a lunch facility, all, a cafeteria, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's great to get us launched. And right now, all the demolition has been done. So it's, it, it's basically there is nothing, not a wall in the whole place. And even as we speak, we're starting to do now uh, the construction part as opposed to the deconstruction part. Okay, well, good luck. Yeah, no fingers are crossed. Okay. Uh, why was the uh, academy started? Well, so uh, our specific uh, iteration of this is really the vision of our board president, uh, Bob Anthony. And he was inspired in his retirement to do something he calls his legacy. He wanted to leave something to the community. He's, he's from here. Okay. He's a Northeast Ohio guy, okay. and he wanted to leave something that would be a kind of permanent benefit to the community. And so he had some connections to Hillsdale College and became familiar with the Barney uh, School Initiative, and um, he got some people around him, formed a sort of circle of uh, supporters of the first hour, as it were, okay. and they became the board. And so that was um, not quite three years ago. But it started as uh, one, one guy really trying to find a way to do something good for the place where he grew up. Yeah, it yeah. shows you what one person can do. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, what is your mission statement? Uh, you know, I wish I knew our mission statement precisely, but I will tell you why, what, what, my, what my iteration of this is, because I don't memorize this stuff. But really what we're trying to do is to um, fuse together two aspects of education for young people that used to be pro forma. Okay. We, we educated young people, obviously, into specific knowledge. We wanted them to be able to know things and to do particular things and to become academically or intellectually you know, smart people. But we also wanted to educate young people into uh, a, what I'll call virtue, the, the, the ability to act as morally aware and morally responsible adults. Okay. And, and that was the education, I think, that even though you and I grew up in different places, probably at our time of the world, that was still in there, right? That was, that was a big part of our education. And uh, we would like that to be the foundation of our okay. education. So it's that fusion of intellectual or academic achievement um, with the development of moral virtue. Well said, Thanks. well said. Uh, what are the uh, Academy's goals? Right now, our Academy's goals are to get those walls built in the school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a basic one. <laughs> but our, our goal is, in, in a way, it's, it's congruent with Bob's vision. What we would like to do is to be a resource for the whole community that is uh, where we're, what we're providing is an academic uh, foundation for, you know, eventually up to about 700 kids, an academic foundation that also has that moral, you know, virtue component, mm -hmm. where what we're doing is we're helping Northeast Ohio to create, uh, in the words of uh, the University of Dallas president when I went there, to create a generation of leaders, right? People who have the capacity, because they have academic achievement and moral awareness, they have the capacity to step forward and offer the, um, their leadership to their communities, that they don't have to grow up to become president of the United States or whatever, but to take on that task as a necessary part of a well-lived human life. And, and uh, that's what we would, I, I would hope that would be our legacy. Our long-term goal would be to produce uh, leaders at the community level 
at the state level and even at the national level, and not necessarily in politics, but in, in business and the arts and sciences and all the places where leadership right now is sorely lacking, we could use a lot of it. Right, and a very worthwhile goal. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the, uh, what was the toughest part of uh, starting the academy? Well, f <laughs> I, think, I think Bob would say, because he's been focused on this, was just pulling together the, the biggest pieces, which was finding a campus and f getting funding. Because while the state provides you per student funding, right now we have no students. So yeah, our per student right. funding is exactly upfront, zero, right? Uh... Um, so we had to find people who were willing to invest in us in the sense that uh, to uh, write a bond for us, to give us that initial funding, to buy the building, then to you know, rehab it, to become a school, to do all of those things has been the great challenge. Now the great challenge for me is building the community that actually is the school. And we have this physical structure and we have all of the financial things around it, all the business things, but now we actually have to build a community. Uh -huh. That is the great challenge, okay. finding 350 kids and their families, because I've said since I pivoted into to pre-collegiate education, we don't enroll kids, we enroll families. Okay, uh, it's an enormous undertaking. It, I, it is. I we, asked that question. We, we may, ha I don't know what we're gonna have to do, but um, we are getting a, a, a very good response. We are only, I would say, a couple of months into our, our earliest, uh, you know, enrollment drives. We're just now gearing up. Being okay. on the show, obviously, is a part of okay. that, right? All right. Um, we already have about a third of our spots pre-registered. Okay. And, and we, we, we clearly expect to hit our 350 uh, kids by the time we open. We're gonna open, the. Uh, it looks like the day after Labor Day. Okay. Because of construction, we won't probably open in um, August. It'll be that first available day in September. Okay. But, um, yeah, so that's, that's going to be the, the, the big challenge, but I think we're meeting it. Okay. Uh, how would you describe your uh, desired culture of the uh, academy? Um, and I think you've done this a, a little yeah, bit already. Yeah, well, as you can, you can imagine, what we want is for, we, we want to create an environment in which kids can enjoy learning, obviously. We don't want this to be a, a you know, some sort of drudgery. Um, Plato said the necessary ingredient in, edu in any education is delight. Right, so we want to be able to create that. But we also have the idea that kids are naturally curious and actually do want to learn if you don't like bore them out of it. Right? Yeah. Um, and, but we want them to also be able to um, learn a classroom behavior that extends beyond the classroom where they can listen, where they can learn the, the, that from patience comes a better outcome Right, so okay. you know, give uh, and what we also want is to put teachers back uh, closer to the center of that educational experience. There's something kind of deceptive about the term, say, student centered learning. Um, all learning is at the end of the day student centered, however, you get there. What happened in that was that teachers got decentered. So, one of the things is we want to put adults back in the center of the classroom experience so that students, among other things, can learn to emulate them, right? Our teachers become exemplars. If we want kids to Good grow up- Good models. To, yeah, if we want kids to grow up to become adults, let's give them a model to, to kind of work off of. So that's the kind of behavior, whatever you can imagine, learning to sit still for a little while, learning to pay attention, but also learning to participate, but participate in positive ways. So that's the culture that we want to uh, develop. Okay. Uh, what is an American classical education? And I think you've covered that already. But yes, but there is a, there is a kind of a, um, just very quickly. So the classical tradition is this long 2,500 year thing that's evolved and changed and has a lot of iterations to it. But there's a core that runs through it. We kind of touched on that. There's the, the sense of education being um, an introduction into an intellectual and moral life uh, that leads to, you know, kind of self-sufficiency and moral autonomy, as the philosophers would call it. Um, in America, that was a, a kind of a standard educational model since before the founding. And uh, so there is an American version of that, and it includes our own uh, attempts to create um, positive political 
culture, um, to experiment in new sort of s social, you know, uh, kinds of relationships. America is very inventive and so on. And, and, uh, and to take a look at the American virtues that were specific to our experiment in political and social life and the heroes that go with that. Right, the Washingtons and the Lincolns, Lincoln's. And, and these folks, uh, you know, and and to and to see how that, that that extends out into all the discourses in America in positive ways, and to recover that, you know, and to and to, to remind students that there've been you know a diversity of voices in America, but there's been a refrain through all of that, which is America's way of expressing its hopes for its version of that Western tradition. We have a unique version of it. Uh, what are the core disciplines of the academy? So the core disciplines, kind of going back to that trivium quadrivium thing, you can yeah. kind of guess where we're going right. with this, right? So we're going to stress, obviously, uh, literature and literacy. Uh, and those are kind of two different components. So there's going to be reading important books. And important books, you know, it doesn't have to be Plato or Dante. In kindergarten, it's going to be the Velveteen Rabbit, you know, and that's, that's you know, we're going to start where, we, we have to start where the kids are. But those are important books because they build skills, they build vocabulary, they, they build um, uh, models, you build myths off of those, all kinds of stuff. So important books, but also then the literacy part is that grammar, the structures of language. So that's important. Social studies, which would be history and geography, so both uh -huh. uh, European, Western history and American history, to start eventually it's world history. We're going to take a look at the globe. Um, and uh, math and science. So science is you know, K through five appropriate, so we'll be doing things like you know, kind of general science, stuff, life science and so on, before the kids get into the very specific kind of lab-based uh, sciences of middle and especially high school, so the sciences that support them, and the arithmetic part of math leading up to pre-algebra. Uh, what criteria are, are emphasized when selecting your teachers and staff to change gears a little bit? Yeah, so um, there's, <laughs> there's a challenge for faculty in particular. We have this very specific curriculum that faculty, even veteran faculty, are going to have to kind of retool. Okay. All right, because it's, a, it's not what they probably are accustomed to. I don't think we're going to be getting faculty who've taught at other Hillsdale schools. You know, we're going to have to train them into that. Um, but before I, I, I spend the time training them how to teach a classical curriculum to K through five, I want to know two things about them. Uh, one is, um, you know, do they have, well, maybe they're the same thing. Per no, they're not. Personality uh, and exemplarity. I want teachers who have the personality to engage with kids of this age. And that's not everybody. I, I for example, think I'm a very personable guy. I would not put me in third grade. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but, there, but there are people who have a, a, a sort of a gift, almost a, a kind of a natural gift okay. for being able to, to speak with and engage young people. I don't care what the curriculum is, that's a must have. And then I also want them as people to be willing to be exemplars. They have to be willing to have their behavior and their a, a sort of comportment uh, be the model for okay. the kids in the classes and 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 pretty I, high standard I, yeah. I better be comfortable having that be the case i can teach you the curriculum I, I i can't teach you to do the rest of that stuff you either are those things or you're not so that's what i'm going to be looking for okay and my next question was what's the best background for teachers and i think you well the, obviously being a decent human being but i would also like teachers who understand that um Education is, the, 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 the nuts and bolts of education are not techniques and methodologies and so forth, but really it comes out of the material itself. If I give you the Velveteen Rabbit you know, to teach, among other things, I want you to teach the Velveteen Rabbit. Right? I want you to have the capacity, as somebody who has studied literature, to be able to teach literature. Now maybe you would rather teach Dostoevsky and great, I'll hire you for 12th grade, but it's the same process. You have to be able to get inside the material and pull out of it all the, okay. the juice that's in there, right? Mm -hmm. And as opposed to having a background that might be just more, um, you know, an education background 
uh, in, in terms of college degree where you learn techniques and methodologies and all that. No, tell me what's the most important thing in the Velveteen Rabbit. What are you going to share with the kids? Okay. You know, so it's uh, subject matter expertise. Uh, how will uh, the academy uh, create and maintain a school environment that you don't have in uh, other schools? That's, um, parents are going to be a big part of this. Okay. Well, it's two, two, two people that I'm not going to be writing checks to, two groups of people. The people I write checks to better do it. Yeah. Right. Um, as, uh, I like to joke, a man of my caliber has great firing power. So, <laughs> um, so I want people that, when they come into okay. workforce to be ready for, to do it. But, but, but uh, parents and student leaders, um, in my experience in the past, is that um, if you can identify student leaders and support them to become leaders in positive ways, that is critical. You can't, it's not a top-down uh, kind of uh, an approach solely. If you don't get student leadership buy-in for your particular approach to education and the, and the social setting and so on, you, you either will be working with these kids or you'll be warring with them. Yeah. That's pretty much it. And one of the ways that um, you can help to shore that all up is to make sure that you have really positive um, parent involvement. Okay. Parents are a key here. Okay, well, uh, this leads right into the next question. How do you encourage and maintain communication with the parents? Well, we have so many different ways to maintain communication with parents, it's almost overwhelming, you know, so everything from just the, the, the really easy emails and those kinds of things. But we're going to have a small, a relatively small community, you know, 350 to 500 kids and, and so on. So we'll have a PTA, PTO, I'll be involved with the leadership there. But we also want to encourage parents to come in and, and do things in the school so that they'll become known, a, a volunteer to help with co-curriculars, okay. right? Um, uh, or extracurriculars, that kind of stuff. Help us put together our events, you know, when we, when we put on a musical or whatever. And if there's a mom or a dad that just has to sing whatever, he's that guy or she's that <laughs> gal, come on in and help us do that. And, and that way we get to know you and your engagement with the school is positive. Okay. Yeah. Will, will the parents have access to their children's teachers and learn what the children are being, are being taught? I mean, you've already kind of touched uh, on that. Absolutely, yes. Um, the, first of all, the curriculum is published. And while we may not have a 100% conformity rate, it's going to be 90 plus percent. Okay. So the parents know what we're going to be teaching their kids and when we're going to be teaching it. And there'll be communication about what assignments are due and so on. And I would like parents to also on their own to get engaged in their own way with what we're teaching their kids o overall. I would like to at some point put together um, a book club that I'll help set up okay. where parents will actually be reading some of the kind of material that their, their kids are reading, maybe at, at a more adult level. But oh, that's I, I, want, I want them to have the access. What's classical education? Hey, Dr. Baum's running book club next week and we're reading Dante. Come by and find out. Okay. Right, so we'll get them involved. That, that's great. Uh, well, what is a typical day going to be like for the students? Um, so our bell will ring at eight o'clock. Okay. So that means their parents are going to do the stop, drop, and roll sometime 7.45-ish, right? right? Okay. At 8 o'clock, we'll have uh, assembly, and uh, we'll do the pledge. We'll do a moment of silent meditation. Um, we will also um, have some kind of specific, uh, specific reference to one or the other of the school's seven articulated virtues. Okay. So we'll have one of the students or a couple of the students come up and, and talk about, let's say the virtue of the month is courage, and come up and talk about what that means, maybe a couple of quotations, um, maybe some examples uh, culled from student experience, sing a few songs, make some announcements, rev the kids up, send them to class by 8.20, 8.25. And then uh, they'll go through their sort of four main subject areas through the course of the day punctuated by music or art, um, phys ed, some recess, we'll have lunch, do all that. For the most part, the days will be somewhat um, orchestrated by the teachers because we won't have set bell ringing periods except for art and music. Um, so if a teacher needs to spend really a lot of time doing 
uh, math on a particular day, then the kids will do as much math as the teacher uh -huh. uh, you know, d determines. And if we're really pushing literacy and the kids are uh, you know, diagramming sentences, if you remember that. Yeah. So they're gonna be diagramming sentences that you know, they may need two periods of that. So there's flexibility within the day, but over the course of a week, they will spend pretty much the you know, right amount of time on the literacy, literature, math, science, social studies stuff with some art music sprinkled in there. The day ends at three o'clock. People come get your kids. If you need to leave them, we're gonna probably have uh, an after-school program that will give uh, working parents whose okay. schedules don't quite Understand. line up. We'll yeah. give them that flexibility, and we'll put that in the in the uh, you know put that on the plans. Okay. Uh, do other uh, Hillsdale Classical Academies exist in Ohio and oh, yeah. other states? Yeah, there's there are dozens and dozens in in the state of Ohio. There are probably about a dozen that are either up and running or on the books. Okay. Uh, two that we work with, um, that is to say they're sort of we consider as sister institutions, uh, Cincinnati Classical and uh, over in Toledo, uh, Northwest Ohio Classical Academy. Okay. Uh, what's been the experience uh, of uh, classical uh, academy students' pro proficiency scores uh, versus uh, non-classical public uh, uh, school it, it's kind of what you would, it, yeah, it's probably what you would expect is that um, the classical academy students um, outperform their public school uh, peers considerably. Um, some, some schools are more successful than others. Cincinnati Classical, for example, is probably one of the top five schools in the state. Understand. Right? So they, 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 they perform well across the board. They're K through 12. Mm -hmm. They've been around for a few years. They've been able to do it. Over in Toledo, similar kinds of experience. They're also K through 12. Um, and they outperform all the public schools in their area significantly in all the areas. To, to follow up, what factors do you think uh, that exist at the classical academies that uh, you know, uh, account for that uh, increase in proficiency scores? Well, I think the curriculum for one, which is a serious, you know, you used the word time-tested before, it's a serious time-tested curriculum. Um, the pedagogical approach, which emphasizes uh, a particular kind of classroom decorum. It's hard for kids to learn if they're not paying attention. Right. Right. So f strategies for helping kids to pay attention. They're not designed to pay attention. You know, we, we all joke, those of us who've raised kids, you know, they all have the attention span of a bug. <laughs> and, but, but the thing is that we all managed to make it through despite those challenges, which are there. Um, there are approaches that um, you know, the adults running the school can take, and we're going to take those. We're going to have, I think, proper classroom decorum, uh, great cl curriculum, uh, dedicated staff. One of the things that I would value if I were teaching at a classical academy um, is the focus on education and, mm -hmm. the op and the opportunity to teach kids 360 degrees. That is, teach kids so that you can you know, affect them in all the ways that you want a young person affected. So that's it, that's, it's not magic. You get good staff, a good curriculum, and a proper environment. It's not the yeah. hardest thing in the world to figure out. It is the hardest thing in the world to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, how uh, is the academy funded? So the state of Ohio funds us uh, we do not derive any income from local property taxes, which is the way that um, the traditional public schools are in part funded. But okay. we get the vast majority of our money comes from Columbus, and some of it comes from the federal government. There is money set aside to support charter schools in America. So not okay. only us here in Ohio, but all across the country, there's a certain amount of money available for charter schools. Okay. For the extra things, we're a nonprofit. We can raise money, so we do we do look for donors. Uh, it all the thing. If you have stuff, if you have money, if you have time, you know, give us all of it. Whatever, <laughs> whatever you have. Okay. Well, uh, my next question: uh, uh, How can viewers help your efforts uh, with this new school? Uh, uh, do you need volunteers? Uh, we do. Um, we we probably need. We'll probably need volunteers more as we get closer to opening. Uh, right now, I think the best thing that folks can do is help us get our message out. Uh, so if uh, you, you know people um, that have school-age kids uh, or school-age grandkids, 
um, mention our school, um, send people to our website, uh, have people come out to our uh, parent meetings that we have one a week. Uh, we have one tonight and we'll have one next week and so on. They're scheduled all the way out into April. So that would be a, a really great way to help. Um, for events that are larger, we always need people who can help us organize or participate at those. That would be great. Um, and as we get closer to school, um, people who think that they might want to step up and be part of a PTA or a PTO and that sort of stuff. So without reaching into your pocket, those are all ways to, to help. Um, to help us with other things, we don't get any money from the state of Ohio until October. So right now we're in what we call year zero, <laughs> I see. right? Yeah. And so um, there are things that need to be done between now and then, marketing and so on, so that if this is a cause that you feel like you'd like to write a check, small, big, it really doesn't matter. But if you feel like you would like to help us with that funding, that would be really greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. so kind of drawn a circle around the school of, of a particular radius, and then we try to go to the libraries that are around in that circle. Some of them we will hit twice because we did them early. Mm -hmm. You know, we did them in December or uh, late. I, I think maybe my first one I did was late November after I moved. I moved to, uh, to the area on November 1st. So I hit the ground running. I think Welcome. I a, I thank you. I think I had a thing on, like on November 3rd or whatever. It's like, bam, there you are. Um, <laughs> But these are nice nights, and uh, you and I were talking about this before we went on camera. You know, they're 90 minutes. Uh, I have a 30-minute sort of thing that I do. Um, a lot of the material that we've covered here. Uh, and then 60 minutes I set aside for questions and answers that would be specific to parents, um, many of whom bring their kids with them, too, so they can kind of hear okay. what's going on. Okay, hear it first. Uh, yeah, so the, they're, they're, they're kind of nice, and then also to, to get a sense of what, the community might look like because other parents will be there and it's an opportunity to rub shoulders uh, early on in the process. Oh, that's great. Uh, where is the academy located? I, I think you mentioned that it, before. So it's uh, 137 Heritage Woods in Copley and that is just west of the 77 exit that dumps you down onto Medina Road. So you get out there, you go west for not even a third of a mile, you turn left and you're in uh, it's a it's a development. It has houses, apartments, and different things. And our building sort of sits right in the middle of this okay. uh, this development there. Okay. Uh, how can someone get in touch with the academy? Yeah. So there's a there's a couple of ways to do that. Our, our website is neocacademy.org, right? So Northeast Ohio Classical Academy. Uh, so go to our web page and there's contact information there as well. Um, there is a contact number that I think you have, might be up on the screen right now. Right, right. Um, that's, that's the 330 number. Right. And that's a general information number. And then, of course, uh, my phone number, people can call me directly. That's 518-221-8497. And people can call me directly with any questions. Okay. Or, volunteering. We're also looking for teachers and staff. So if people are looking for oh, a really great job. This would be a career. Uh, yeah, they should okay. be able, yeah, it's a little career uh, recruitment here. Okay. Uh, give us a call or send us an email. Okay. We're up and running and looking for people. Okay. On, on your uh, website, is there a donate button? Yeah. There is a donate button. There is an enrollment button. There is a um, careers button. So any of the things that, you know, sort of the big categories of relationship to the school, there's uh, a button that will get you there. Okay. Uh, I asked this question of all uh, my interviewees. Uh -huh. uh, what, uh, in summary, what makes sense to you and what doesn't? About our school or about the project generally? Uh, about the project, I guess. Well, so here's what makes sense to me is that I have, I've been involved somehow or another in what you might call classical education at all kinds of levels mm -hmm. since I was 19 years old, since I had that talk with Dr. Jane Brown when I was sitting in Rome. And it has uh, informed every aspect of my life and it's been a good and varied life. Okay. Um, I've lived all over the place, I've had abundant opportunities, um, I've had the opportunity to learn, unlearn, and relearn things through my whole life. <laughs> and, uh, and all of it somehow or another connects to this experience. And okay. so what makes sense to me is the experience. All right. right? I, I think just young people will benefit so much 
from having uh, access to this deep well of knowledge, wisdom, challenge, and so forth. Because the, you know, the classics and the, the great works, they don't answer questions as much as they get in your head and make you ask questions, right? And, and then send you off into a life. It just makes so much sense to me. What doesn't make sense is why public education stopped doing this. Yeah. You know, when I, uh, uh, right now I'm reading Lincoln, uh, about Lincoln, Team of Rivals, right, that great book. And every one of the folks who sat in Lincoln's cabinet, whether they were self-educated ed- like Lincoln or real scholars like Seward, you know, beneficiaries of the best education America had to offer at the time, they all learned the same stuff. They got us through the most difficult time in the nation's history. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything more to ask than that. Like, why can't we still do that? Yeah, we need great leaders. We do, and they don't just happen. They, you, yeah. you, you, you have these men of, of great talent, you know, the Sam and Chases and the William Sewards and the Abraham Lincolns and so on, but uh, you have to give them something to nourish that na- natural greatness. And uh, I wrote my dissertation on the Greek philosopher Plutarch and it used to be the case in the 18th century that if a family could afford one book, it was the Bible. If they were a little better off and they could afford two, it was the Bible and Plutarch's Lives of Illustrious Men. That's, that's, the, that's an education. That's an encyclopedia in a volume. And that's another thing that we could do is, is learn. Uh, young people today, I think, are in crisis. They don't aspire to greatness. I don't know what they aspire to, but they're not aspiring to greatness. Understand. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much for appearing. Uh, uh, your academy sounds like a wonderful addition for the people of uh, the Cleveland area uh, mm-hmm. to have that functioning. It's just wonderful. Thanks, Rudy, and thanks for having me on. It was really great. Okay. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, please, uh, our uh, email addresses will appear on the bottoms of the screen and the websites. Uh, Uh, If uh, you have any questions or comments, you could always get in touch with us. If you would like to appear on this show or you know an interesting person uh, that would uh, like to be interviewed on this show, please send us uh, their contact information. And remember, uh, seatbelts save lives. The preceding program was presented to you by Community Producer. The statements, views, and opinions expressed were not necessarily those of ALC-TV or the City of Avon Lake.